really a great, great pleasure of mine. And I'm thrilled um, to have Richard Leiter. Uh, my nickname for uh, Richard Leiter is R. Elder. And uh, we go back to 1988. And, um, you know, the, the there's there's I know him personally. I know him professionally. We've worked together. We've trekked through the wilds of Africa together. Um, we've had a number of fun conversations over gin and tonics and English breakfast tea. <laughs> so there's a lot I could say there. And, um, but let me just say some background for Richard. Um, He's the founder of Invention, the Purpose Company, and he's one of the preeminent executive life coaches, and he is ranked by Forbes magazine as one of the top five most respected executive coaches in the conference board as a legend in, his, in coaching. Uh, Richard has written 10 books, and three have been bestsellers and has sold over 1 million copies and been translated into 20 languages. The most recent is this revised edition of The Power of Purpose, and I highly recommend this, any of his books, but this is really foundational, this piece right here, third edition. Um, he's the church chief curator for the content for AARP's A Life Reimagined, which came out of his book, Life Reimagined. And uh, he re uh, regularly appears in different media outlets, um, PBS, public television, NPR, public radio, and he's featured in the PBS special, The Power of Purpose. Um, as a senior fellow at the University of Minnesota's Center for Spirituality and Healing, he founded the Purpose Project. So this this goes on and on and on. Um, and um, thank you for coming on, RL. And I want to say to all of you out there is take your notes, any questions you have about living a purposeful life, because this has been Richard's life study, truly his life study. And um, he's He's seen that going on for decades now, too. So, Richard, thank you for being here and our elder. Strozzi, what a privilege. And thank you for a kind and uh, generous uh, introduction. And I've been looking forward to this. And I've been on all day with the other three sessions. And so I want to uh, build on that. But let me uh, put on my slides here. And... Um, All right, so I would like to use a few slides. They're all simple, but they're all good placeholders for uh, this discussion of what is your purpose and purpose and, and presence. And purpose is really the answer to the question, uh, why do you get up in the morning? It's as simple as that. You can look at it in a lot of different ways. But the, the, the key question is, the, or the key concept here is that purpose is not a luxury. Purpose is fundamental. Purpose is fundamental to health, to healing, to longevity, uh, to productivity, and uh, on and on. And so um, purpose has been around a long time, has a lot of different concepts to it. So I want to give you today or offer you a checkup. Uh, you may take your body in for a checkup occasionally. You may take your car in for a checkup or your checkbook in for a checkup. How about a meaning checkup? So I want to take you into a purpose uh, checkup today. And it's uh, my uh, study and it's also the study of others that one out of three people today doesn't have a clear reason to get up in the morning. And fundamentally, that's, that's a challenge. So first slide here is that purpose is the answer to the question, why? Why do I get up in the morning? <clears throat> Andrew talked about that uh, in the Andrew and Stacy uh, segment. And uh, so, you know, every morning we get up. And he said that oftentimes, um, and I wrote it down, he said very few people wake up on purpose, that it's almost reflexive. They go for their cell phone, they go for their cup of coffee or their paper or whatever they're going to do for the for the day. And so purpose is really the why, the why question. And purpose is a verb. If nothing else, I think the core message here is that purpose is a verb. It's an action in the world. It's a stand. It's a commitment to action, a narrative behind that. And it's, uh, as we've learned, and as I've learned from Strozzi and his colleagues over many years, it's totally, uh, 
imperative that we embody that, that sense of, of purpose and not let hurry sickness and hijacking of the human moment with technology get in, in, the, in the way of that. Uh, I'm a writer and I'm a reader and I love books and I go into bookstores all the time. And I was in a bookstore recently in Denver, the Tattered Cover, a great independent bookstore. And I walked in and I asked the lady at the front of the desk, I said, um, can you tell me where the self-help section is? And she said, well, if I tell you, won't that defeat the whole purpose? And uh, I laughed and uh, she didn't. And I went to, the, and I realized that, what, what, you know, I was going to see if the self-help section, see if they're carrying my books or Strozzi's books or others. But what I realized that, what we're talking about here today is not self-help, it's self-realization. It's the realization of who we are, why we're here, and what we're up to with our, our lives in, in certain ways. So the last, um, in writing that third edition, people said, well, why did you need to write another edition? It's already a classic bestseller. Why did you update it? And I said, because I'm updated. I matured and I want to put in what I've learned into this book because I think it's important. So I added four new chapters and other things. And the last chapter is, can science explain purpose? That's the last chapter of the new third edition of the power of purpose. So let me just say, uh, you know, and I think Andrew did a great job with Stacy in um, grounding this for us in, in uh, neuroscience. But I've been in the last few years visiting neuroscience labs around the country. And one of the uh, people I visited with was a guy named Dr. Majid Fatoui, who's an Iranian, escaped from Iran many, many years ago, but he's a um, neurologist, uh, runs neuroscience lab now in, in Washington, D.C., but used to be at Johns Hopkins, trained at Harvard. And we were talking about science and purpose, and, and he said this to me, and I'm asking you this question. Imagine a pill, he said, that would reduce the effects of Alzheimer's significantly, would reduce the incidence of macroscopic stroke by as much as 40%, would help with sleep disorders and sleep apnea. And he went on and on. Imagine a pill. He said, then he turned to me, he said, what would you pay for that? And I said, Phew, I don't know if it was available. It would be worth an awful lot. And he said, well, it's free. And he said, it's purpose. We now know that purpose in the brain <clears throat> and purpose and longevity and purpose and health are inextricably linked. So it's not just mind-body activity, it's mind-body activity, as Strozzi would say, and I do as well, for the sake of what? It's for the sake of something that we care about that makes the difference in the brain and the body in, in, uh, in many ways. So let me share three lessons about purpose, three core life lessons about purpose. The first is that purpose is a choice. It's a choice when we get up in the morning about how we want to live our lives and what for the sake of what that day is, is about. I listen for a living. And uh, I've been listening now and interviewing people over the, the age of 65 for many, many years. And I found three things in interviewing people over the age of 65. When I asked them this question, Stacy was talking about people when they're dying. Well, this is before they're dying, but they're older. They're in the uh, second half of life and, uh, or the last fourth or third or whatever. But I asked them the question, this question, if you could live your life over, what, uh, what did you learn? What would you do differently? And they said three things. Number one, they'd be more reflective the second time around. And that's what this webinar is all about is stepping back, pushing the pause buttons to look at the big picture and our own lives. Secondly, they said if they could live their life over again, they would take more risks the second time around. They'd be more courageous. And it wasn't about trekking in the bush. It wasn't about financial risks. There were two risks that they had the most regrets about. Number one was career. And we spend 60% of our life working and so uh, many people said, I wish I would have found a better fit because this is the biggest investment of my time. My 60% of my most precious currency, my time is spent working. And so, and the other uh, thing that they had regrets about were relationships, being more courageous in their relationships, courageous conversations, um, centered presence, if you will, in relationships. And the third thing they said 
if they could live their life over again was that they would be clearer earlier about their purpose, their reason for getting up in the morning. They didn't always use that terminology, but that was a regret. So reflection, courage, purpose and meaning, that's what this webinar is about. So I'm gonna to try to tie some of these threads together uh, about this. But there, before I do, there are three myths about purpose. The first myth is that purpose is a cause. You have to have a cause. No, you don't have to have a cause. You have to have a clear mindset about what you want and what you care about. Second myth about purpose is that it'll be revealed to you if you just get old enough or lucky enough. No, purpose is revealed through practices. We practice and in that practice comes the revelation. And third, purpose is a luxury. No, purpose is absolutely not a luxury. Purpose is fundamental to who we are as human beings. It's fundamental to our lives, and I'm gonna to try to prove that to you in just a minute in uh, no uncertainty. But let me tell you first, or share with you first of all, in addition to Strozzi and other of our colleagues, this is one of my mentors, Victor Frankl. Some of you may have heard of his book, Man's Search for Meaning. It's one of the classic books of all time. The Library of Congress says that Man's Search for Meaning is uh, one of the 25 most influential books in American history. It's number 12 on the list. I met Viktor Frankl in person in 1968. I got out of graduate school in counseling psychology, trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. And all of a sudden, uh, I saw that Frankl was doing a seminar in San Diego. I didn't have any money, but I scraped enough to go to, to San Diego. And it was one of those fortuitous encounters that changed my life forever. And Frankl, if you don't know the story, was a, a very um, well-known thought leader in Vienna, along with uh, Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler and Carl Jung and others. Frankl was the spiritual one of the group, Jewish uh, neurologist, psychiatrist, training resident doctors. At the very height of his work, he was taken by the Nazis, his whole family and shipped off to a series of four concentration camps. His family was killed. His pregnant wife, Tilly, dead. His siblings, his parents, dead. He was liberated from Auschwitz. He weighed 87 pounds. He went back to Vienna, where he was from. He didn't see very well. He had a lot of health issues, but he healed. And he sat down when he was strong enough, and he wrote Man's Search for Meaning in Nine Days. And the essence of the book is this in front of you. The last of the human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Stacy talked a lot about chaos and complexity. This is the way of the world, but we still have choice. Frankl said, I could get up in the morning and give somebody else a kind word, a crust of bread, a hug. A ho I could envision my beloved and have a hope for what I would do when I got out of here. And things like this. So, First and foremost, purpose is a, a choice. Secondly, purpose is an aim outside of ourselves. It's an aim beyond our goals. It's the goal of our goals in, in um, many ways. Sometimes we're pushed by pain, as we've heard, and sometimes we're pulled by possibility. And during those times, what Frankl would say is this, don't ask what your purpose in life is ask this, what is life asking of me today? That's the core of purpose. That is the power of purpose. It's that choice, that embodied presence. What is life asking me to, of me today? And then it's to step into it with an aim. And that, that aim is always outside of ourselves. And so purpose is that, that aim. We live today in a VUCA world. VUCA is an acronym, V-U-C-A. It actually came from the Army War College, and it stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. Sounds a lot like what Stacy was talking about a few minutes ago with chaos and complexity. A VUCA world is what we have. So the key is how do we live purposefully in a VUCA world? What do we stand for? What won't we stand for and who do we stand with? When we talk about an aim outside of ourselves, those are the, the key 
activating questions. What do you stand for? What won't you stand for? What are those boundaries? And who do you stand with in many ways? That's a centered presence. So purpose is an aim, and an aim is our intention to contribute to the well-being of others outside of ourselves. Strozzi mentioned of our trips to Africa together. We've had the privilege of trekking together in the bush twice. This is one of the people we cross paths with. His name is Kampala. He's from a tribe called the Hadza, H-A-D-Z-A. The Hadza are hunter-gatherers who've been around be, uh, between 75 and 100,000 years. They call them, in the genome project, they call these the original people. They've been around so long. They are a total sharing culture. They share everything. Can you imagine? Doesn't sound like our past election year, but uh, that's a whole nother conversation. I was uh, interviewing and talking with Kampala around the fire and he was getting a little tired of my questions. So he took me aside and he said, Richard, do you mind if I ask you a question? And I said, sure, go ahead. And he said, do you know what the two most important days in your life are? And I said, sure, birth and death. Oh, he was chagrined. He looked at the ground. This is all through a translator. I can actually speak pretty good Swahili, but he speaks an ancient click language, Khoisan click language. And so through a translator, I said, well, what are the two most important days? And he said this, he said, the day you're born and over here, surviving birth is a big thing. And the day that you determine why you were born. That he said is what has kept us alive is that everybody in our community has a place, has a, a fundamentally a, a position in society, in a sharing culture. We all, as Strozzi was saying uh, in one of in his portion, he said, it's bringing our gifts forward and sharing them. And he said, we as elders help people to share those, those gifts. So purpose is an evolutional impulse. It's not just a psychological or a spiritual concept, although it's both of those and more. It's an evolutional impulse to make things better. And what we know is this, isolation is fatal. Going it alone in any society, a bad idea. And as we age, going it alone is even a worse idea. But that's why these folks and what it's gonna take for us to survive is to come together in, in uh, community. So the uh, third thing is purpose is a practice. We know this, that's what this webinar is about in, in, uh, in so many ways. And uh, purpose is a practice. You know, the, they say that knowledge is only rumor until it's in the muscle. And purpose needs to be in the muscle. It needs, when you get up in the morning, we get up with a purposeful sense of what we want the day to be about. So I'm gonna share a couple practices in a minute but I wanna talk about practice for, for a moment. I had uh, lunch with the happiest man in the world. Uh, his name is Matthew Ricard. If you were to Google happiest man in the world, you'd get the name Matthew Ricard. Now, some of you may have heard of him. He's written a book on happiness. He's come out with a huge book now on purpose called Altruism with the Science of Purpose. So I'm having lunch with uh, Matthew because as a senior fellow in the medical school at the University of Minnesota, uh, he was coming to speak and I was to introduce him. And Matthew Ricard is a Frenchman. In fact, he's a PhD biochemist from uh, Paris, who in his late 20s uh, took a, a spiritual odyssey to India and never came back again. And uh, he stayed over there, he studied spirituality and particularly Buddhism. He became a Buddhist monk. He became the translator for the Dalai Lama and traveled the world with the Dalai Lama. And he, he's created over 200 of his own compassionate purpose, service-oriented projects. And he's, uh, he's called the happiest man in the world because the neuroscience labs in the US have studied him. You know, they put on the God helmet and they, they ask him questions and they measure his brainwave activity and measure his blood samples and MRIs and all this kind of stuff. And so he's called the happiest man in the world and he's not very happy about it. And here's why because as we're gonna have lunch and we're standing, uh, waiting to go uh, to our table, I said, Matthew, how do you get to be the happiest man in the world? And he turned to me, smiled and said one word, practice. He said, purpose is a practice and it's based on compassion. We get up in the morning and we bring who we are 
to what we do on a moment to moment to moment basis with compassion. That's the power of purpose. So whether it's Kampala sitting around a fire that he's never been more than 25 kilometers or a biochemist who's a world renowned Buddhist monk, purpose is a practice. They're all saying you know, the same thing and it's in the muscle. And so I teach two minute purpose practices. The Strozzi Institute teaches practices. I've had the pleasure of learning many of these from Richard and his colleagues, but you know, this one is a simple one. And that is, I call it mind over mattress. Mind over mattress is the first thing in the morning, do, three, do, do a two minute purpose practice. Before going to your phone, your coffee or anything else, pause. So two minute pause takes no minutes. Secondly, breathe. Richard taught the centering breath practices. Stacy talked about those. Two minute breath practice to center yourself. The third step is to picture somebody this day whose life you wanna make a difference. You picture first thing in the morning going through your day and picture one person, one situation where you wanna make a difference and picture yourself actually making a difference in that situation and make a commitment out loud in the moment, I'm gonna make a difference in that moment today. I guarantee you that if you do this on a regular basis, your life will shift and you'll understand the power of purpose, that it comes in the purpose moments day after day after day after day. And so um, working with pur purpose is, as others have said today, it's like going to the gym. You start, maybe you can't do a pull up, but you practice. And then eventually you get a little stronger and a little stronger and a little stronger. And over time, the power of purpose, be it becomes uh, relevant um, to us. Work is core to our lives. As I said earlier, we spend 60% of our, our life working and work is core to our well-being. And so I wanna talk a little bit here about working on uh, purpose. But before I do that, I wanna give you a purpose. For some of you who may say, oh, this is too hard or this is too abstract or whatever, I wanna talk uh, about a default purpose. So my request here is that you make a commitment right now to write down today on a post-it these words, grow and give, and put this on your mirror today. And here's grow and give is the universal purpose practice. If you get up every day and you commit to grow today and to give, you will be embodying the power of purpose if you activate that and actually make that part of your habits. And so um, in the morning, as you're brushing your teeth, you could use the two-minute purpose practice I, guess I just gave you, or you could uh, um, just use this. Ask yourself, how am I going to grow and give? If you're not growing, if you're not curious, and growing is really about curiosity. If you're not curious, you don't have as much to give. You're not as open to what's going on around you. So grow and give. How are you gonna do that today? And then at the end of the day, as you're brushing your teeth before you go to bed, you look at your post-it on your mirror and you say, and you, you're hold, you hold yourself accountable. How did I grow and how did I give this day? And so if you do this for a week, I commit to you that you will know more about your purpose. You will be able to put it in your own words. My purpose is to help others unlock their purpose. And you could say, well, that's great. That's your brand. That's what you do. That's how you make a living, et cetera. Well, it wasn't always that. It evolved over time through growing and giving what I found myself truly passionate about and getting up to do and feeling, uh, even at my age right now, at the age of 72, growing and giving and helping others unlock their purpose, I feel a stronger or as strong a passion as I ever have in my life for it. And it brings a, a core of vitality to me that uh, uh, I, I don't know what I'd do without. So let's look at working on purpose here. What do you do? Oftentimes in a social setting, the question is, what do you do? And the question, that's a dangerous question. Why is it a dangerous question? Because you are not what you do. There's an old adage that says, if you are what you do, when you don't, you aren't. 
Well, many times we get to a place in life where we don't. Could be retirement, could be out of work, could be in a transition of some sort. But what do you do is, it's really, what are you passionate about? Next time over the holidays here when you're at a party and someone says, well, what do you do? Don't answer it. Flip the question and ask this. I'm passionate about, what are you passionate about? And you will either get a great conversation or someone will look at you like, what planet did you come from? And, uh, but you'll find a very good conversation if you say, I'm passionate about, what are you passionate about? I use this for particular photo here because uh, I was giving a talk in Houston and there was a man sitting in the front row and uh, uh, I looked at his name badge during the break and this was about uh, life reimagined, about reimagining the second half of life and he looked like he was about 40 years old and uh, I, during the break I said, uh, uh, I looked at his name badge and it said the Johnson Space Center, NASA, and I said, are you an astronaut? And he said, no, I'm the chief of internal medicine for the astronauts and their families at the Johnson Space Center. I went, oh, what are you doing here? You don't look old enough to be at this conference. And he said, I'm here to, help, to uh, figure out how to help astronauts make a transition into the next phase of their life when they, never can be, when they can't be an astronaut any longer. I said, is that a big problem? And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Leiter, what would you do in the second half of your life if you'd walked on the moon in the first half? Well, I laughed, but he didn't. We all are in these periods of inflection points, these transitions. It could be a health transition, a financial or work or relationship or on and on different uh, or retirement transition. And during those inflection points, we need to step back and look at what we bring to the party and what our, our purpose uh, is. And so the question is not only what do you do, but why do you do what you do? What is the point of the exercise? When I was, um, before I uh, created my own company, uh, almost four decades ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth, uh, I was the chief human resource officer for what is now U.S. Bank, it was called First Bank at, at the time. But I had a side hustle. Many of you might have a side hustle going on, what's called a side hustle. And being a coach and a counselor by training, uh, I would, I, my side hustle was called Lunch Hour Limited. I would uh, uh, coach you during lunch if you bought me lunch. So that's why I called it Lunch Hour Limited. It was limited to lunch, you bought lunch, and I coached you. Well, I enjoyed this so much, and I was su very successful at it. I had an 80% success ratio. 80% of the people that I coached quit. Well, my uh, boss didn't think this was such a great idea. And, uh, but they didn't just quit and leave, like quit their day job. They quit and stayed. They went back to, and reinvented their job, reimagined their work, looked at who they really were and what they were really doing with their most precious currency, their time, and why they were doing what they were doing. And many of them wanted daily bread and daily meaning. I think that's a good phrase for many people today. Sure, we want daily bread, we want money, and we, want, and we need it, and we want health care, but we also hunger for daily meaning in our lives. And so I ended up leaving and uh, working on this. This is the model that Viktor Frankl shared with me that was life-changing in many ways. And what it represents is, if you look at the horizontal line, it represents your life from failure on the left to success on the right. And if you look at the vertical line, it looks, it's from despair at the bottom to meaning at the top. So what we have in the lower quadrant is a job. Have you ever had a job? A job is something you do to make money, to make ends meet. It may not give you a lot of fulfillment and a lot of money, but maybe you get that fulfillment outside of work. We also have something called a career in the lower right-hand side. Why is it in the lower right? Because almost all people, as they go up the ladder of success, from failure to success perhaps, flatten out. They get to a point in their life where they've stopped growing, or they're bored, or uh, as Viktor Frankl said, they suffer from EV. EV is not ED, by the way. EV is existential vacuum. 
they're successful on the outside, but they're not successful on the inside. They're not fulfilled. And so some people have also a sense of mission. At certain points in our life, we may have something we really care about, but it, you know we're not getting paid for it or it's not bringing us money. And sometimes we have the luxury of doing that or we do it as a side hustle in certain ways. But I submit what we're really after here is calling. And so that's what I want to talk about before we stop here for a minute. Calling. What is your calling? Work 1.0 is a job. Work 2.0, career. Work 3.0, the new work, the deep work that uh, Andrew and Stacy were talking about and Richard were talking about earlier. The deep work is our calling. And here's my definition of calling. Calling is the inner urge to give your gifts away. It's the inner urge to bring who you are to what you do on a daily uh, basis. And calling is, uh, what's interesting about this, you've all probably heard about the Monday blues or the Sunday fives. Five o'clock Sunday, people start getting anxious about going to work on Monday. Monday morning, the Monday blues, when do most heart attacks happen in this country? Monday, nine o'clock Eastern time. When do most Google searches happen for stress? Monday morning, nine o'clock. What's that all about? Why do only 30% of the population actually wanna get up and go to work every day? Well, I submit that they haven't found their calling, their daily bread and their daily meaning. So is your calling calling? Do you have that inner urge? Here's how you find, here's how you scratch that. I call it the napkin test. Actually, I call it the got a minute school of coaching since this is a short webinar. But um, got a minute is, comes from this. Um, in my work, people often say because they're suffering from hurry sickness and they're always on their cell phones, always going somewhere, never being anywhere, they'll say, Richard, got a minute? Can you tell me what I should do with the rest of my life? Well, if I only have a minute, I give them the napkin test. I say, pull out a napkin and write down this formula. G plus P plus V equals C. The power of purpose comes from this formula, from you getting up in the morning and using your gifts on things you care about in an environment that fits your values equals your calling. Gifts, what are gifts? Gifts are those things you care deeply about. Gifts are things that you feel your hand turns to naturally. Others observe you uh, enjoying it. And the third thing about a gift is, so first you enjoy it, something your hand turns to naturally. Second, others often enjoy it, observe you enjoying it. And third, you can't remember learning it. It's been with you so long that it just comes so naturally to you, you may not even value it. And fourth, you love practicing it. You love doing it more and learning more about it. So if you get up in the morning and you use your gifts and you're self-aware, self-realizing, you know what those are, then the question is, what do you care about? What do you want to use those gifts in the service of? For the sake of what do you want to use your gifts? And values are where you do what you do. How do you where do you do it and with whom do you do it? And that equals your, your calling in, uh, in many ways. And so this is the way forward, I believe, to really discovering the power of purpose, to get up on a daily basis and to use our gifts on, for the sake of things we care about in an environment that really values us, that we have a voice and it's a good fit for us. <clears throat> so here's what, uh, E.B. White said, he said, I arise in the morning, torn between a desire to improve or save the world and a desire to enjoy or savor the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. Well, with all due respect to E.B. White, it makes it easier to plan the day because a day where we get up in the morning to not only add value, but also to, to enjoy and to be connected to others in community this makes it easier to plan the day. Grow and give, as I said uh, earlier. So let me sh uh, end with a story um, 
which kind of wraps it up here before we um, open it up to questions. And it's the biggest learning I ever had about purpose. I was um, teaching a seminar. I'm in Minneapolis and um, talking to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota today. And uh, I was uh, teaching a seminar about four hours north of Minneapolis, way up in the northern woodlands of uh, Minnesota, uh, a number of years back. And uh, this is pre-cell phone and pre-technology that way. And it's about four o'clock in the afternoon. I had a couple hundred people and one of my client, my colleagues was there teaching it with me. And someone walked up in the afternoon and handed me a slip of paper. And it said, call home now with the now underlined. And I said, you mean now, like this minute? And they said, yeah, now. So I gave the 200 people a break and I went to the landline, found a landline and called home. And the message was this, your mother has had a stroke. She's in intensive care at St. Joseph's Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, she's not going to live through the, day, through the night. It doesn't look like. You better come home now. And so uh, my mother had, was 78. She had had breast cancer. She was doing, I thought, pretty darn well, but she had it for 10 years and had uh, made it quite well and was active and independent. So I left and turned the seminar over to my colleague and I drove home. And as I'm driving home, the music, it was the fall, the leaves were beautiful, they looked beautiful, the music and the station moved me. And I got to the hospital about 11 o'clock at night and uh, no one else was around except the intensive care nurse. She was in intensive care. And that nurse uh, ushered me into the uh, hospital room and there was my mother taking big, deep, gasping breaths, her eyes closed. Uh, I had no idea what to do. I'd never been in a situation like this before. So I just lost it. And I turned to the nurse and I said, could you just leave me here by myself? And she did, and she closed the door, and I just bumbled around in the room. And then it occurred to me that maybe I should thank her. And so I got up on the bed, and I picked her up and held her in my arms. And I looked down in her face, her eyes were closed, and I said, Mom, I think it's time to go. Thank you. And when I said thank you, she opened her eyes, took two more breaths, and died in my eyes, in my arms right then at that moment. And it's even emotional to this day telling that story. I learned more about purpose in that nanosecond than at any other time. I've studied it in the seminary. I've studied it in neuroscience labs. I've studied from a psychological and philosophical angle. I studied it in Africa and other parts of the world. But you know what? That purpose thing, it doesn't weigh anything. Like presence, it doesn't weigh anything. You can't always measure it but you know it when you're around it. And, you, and the power of presence when it leaves, and when it leaves for good, you know it's gone. My mother's purpose, she was a stay-at-home mom during that era. I think she wanted completion, like we all do. At the end of our lives, we want to know that our life mattered. Mattering matters to every single human being alive. And that is the power of presence. And that's the option, the choice we have on a day-to-day -day basis. So purpose is a choice. It's an aim. It's a practice. And my purpose is to help others unlock theirs. So I hope I've helped with that with you today. If so, it's been a well-lived day uh, for me. And the key is to live purposely, not asking what is my purpose, but asking the question as Viktor Frankl asked me and has asked many others, what is life asking of me today? Uh, thank you for your listening and uh, let me stop here and uh, end of my slides. It's my website if you have any interest whatsoever. I have a lot of different things including a video of that story I just told you. Everything's free on my website so I'm going to stop my uh stop here and um
uh, I'll get out of this and see what wants to happen question wise. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> we have a question from Kristen. Does everyone have a calling? It's actually two questions. Does everyone have a calling? And does the idea of a calling threaten bureaucratic industrial jobs in America? Uh, first, yes, everyone has a calling. Uh, uh, everyone has gifts. And the, the question is whether they uh, are uh, awake to those gifts and have the courage to bring those gifts forward. It doesn't mean that always it's going to be your paid job or your career. You're called from cradle to grave. You're called to bring your gifts forward, whether you're retired or uh, I've been studying uh, elderhood. I've been studying older adults now for many, many years. And um, that we find that people who are, who, uh, for example, are even in assisted living or have Alzheimer's, if they have a reason to get up in the morning to water a plant or read to a kid or feed a dog, they do way better than someone who doesn't. So your calling can be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be the whole job formula that I, I shared uh, along the way. The second thing is, is that it's the end of work as we know it. Work has really changed. The structure of work has changed. The structure of the economy has changed in many ways. And um, is it okay to enjoy your work? Not only is it okay, it's imperative that you enjoy your work. Because if you don't get up to go to do what you enjoy, you're not going to work at mastering it. And if you don't work at mastering it, you're not going to get paid as well, and you're probably not going to keep your job. Everybody today is an experiment of one. Everybody is the economy of you, regardless of where you are. And so you're not going to do those 300 hours of practice if you don't enjoy it, if it's, a, if it's laborious. So finding a way to, to, to put your gifts, passions, and values to work is a life skill of the 21st century that all of us are going to have to learn. If I had a dollar for every parent who came up to me and after an adult workshop and said, do you do this for young people? Because I got a kid who's got a great education but clueless about where to work or how to put it all together in the work world, uh, I'd be a rich man because this is a life skill for all of us now to learn how to bring the best of who we are, not only to our paid work, but to the world and to the communities we live in. Thank you. Here is a question from Linda. What if you've discovered your calling, but are struggling with finding the organization or place or people with whom it would be best to offer your gifts to the world with? Any suggestions on how to move forward? Put together a sounding board. A sounding board, I believe all people today should have a sounding board. A sound, sounding board is your kitchen cabinet. And your kitchen cabinet uh, or sounding board, those people who you bounce your ideas off of. You know, I said earlier, isolation is fatal. Don't go it alone. Well, sounding board is one antidote or one solution. So on your sounding board, you need a committed listener who can really listen to and discern your gifts, passions, and values to make sure you're clear about it. Secondly, you need a catalyst, someone who gives you the size 12 boot and gets you out there to explore, to open up avenues on the internet and with others to figure out where this work is that you want to do. Third is a wise elder, somebody who can help you to see the big picture and may know of what's going on out there more than you. And the fourth person on your sounding board is a wise younger somebody who can help you look at it from a different vantage point. So sounding boards are, are not necessarily going to give you the exact job, but they're going to help you make sure you're clear, make sure you're not whining about not, those jobs aren't out there. They are out there. I got files full of, of stories of people, who, and I write about it all the time, uh, who say, well, this is great, but loving what you do, but there are there aren't any jobs out there that'll pay me to do this. There are plenty of jobs out there that'll pay you to do that. You just haven't found it yet. So the process of, exp of reflecting and connecting and exploring is imperative. The exploring part of it can be done in a whole variety of ways. Start with a sounding board. Great, great. Uh, this is from James. 
why do you think we struggle so much in life to take risks in relationship and vocation? The question is, why do we struggle so much with it? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I don't know. As I said, we're all an experiment of one. We all have our own reasons for our struggles. But my assessment is that most of us didn't get much guidance uh, with how to go about this process of working on purpose or living on purpose. So we have to do it through trial and error. And so that's why so many millennials today and younger people are so hungry for mentors and for guidance. Where are the wise elders? Where are the fires to sit around these, these days? So I think well, the reason we struggle is partially that uh, we haven't had much guidance. And secondly, oftentimes we're isolated. We, we go it alone, which is not uh, uh, a good idea. Thank you. Um, it's not really a question, but just an acknowledgement that maybe you want to react to. It says, first, Richard, thank you for the richness of your offering today. Your story of being with your mother in her last moments is a timely gift. Even when I don't know what to do in a grab, I can always say thank you. Uh, thank you for that and uh, that comment. And, you know, uh, I want to say that um, Stacy talked about somatic awareness, somatic practices, and somatic openings. And that was an opening for me in the way that I interpret it. And this whole business of belonging and dignity comes from bringing our offer into the world and not asking, you know, why the world isn't doing it for me, but asking as Frankel did again, what is life asking of me today? And how can I step in a small way into a, a purpose moment? And that embodied sense of internal worth, whether you get acknowledged or not, that comes from those purpose moments, makes every single day fantastic. You know, it's uh, roughly on my clock here uh, where I live, uh, I'm in the central time zone, 247. Yesterday, at this exact time, 151,600 people died. I didn't. I'm alive. Every day, 150,000 people die. I'm alive. I get to choose. I get to get up and have a practice and an aim. I mean, this is, this is a miracle. And I don't want to waste that time. And part of I think uh, uh, presence and purposeful presence is to acknowledge the precious time we have and that the future is not promised to anybody. And this moment's not promised to anybody. And the more aware we are of death and the, the, the uh, preciousness of life, the more present we become. Hmm. Here is a question from Mark. What is life asking of me today seems so externally driven. I thought purpose was an internal alignment. Can you speak to this? Perhaps purpose is, is an interface between internal and external worlds question? Sure, I've, 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 it's who we bring to that moment. So self-awareness is the awareness of, of, of the who and the externalization that I was speaking of is who we bring to that moment. What's the gift that I can give at this moment? And it could be the just, I mean, the greatest gift we can give Anybody is the gift of listening, I believe, to witness, to be witness to their life without any ad other than just being and being present. And so the being present is a choice. And every transaction is about me or is it about you. And, you know, uh, uh, Andrew talked about Maslow. I met Abraham Maslow in 1969, the year before he died. And at the end of his life, some of the people who always quote the Maslow hierarchy may not know that in his, on his deathbed, practically, he, uh, say, he added another layer to his famous Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the top need that he added was transcendence. He and Frankel had an uneasy existence with each other. And all of a sudden, at the very end of Maslow's life, he said that the basic top of the pyramid the ultimate is not self-actualization or self-realization. It's transcendent. It's, it's getting beyond self-absorption and giving 
growing and giving, if you will, the way I added it before. And then the, his wife went on to publish the book, The Farther Reaches of, of Human Nature, which uh, documented this, what I just said about transcendence. I think that's, you know, purpose is spiritual, but it's played out in the purpose moments and in the practices. Mm. Thank you. Um, those are all the questions. Is there something you want to say before we wrap up? Thank you, Richard. <laughs> and Richard, we thank you from all of us at the Strozzi Institute for joining us today. And I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of all the participants for your wonderful wisdom and the gifts you've given today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. <laughs>